Most of you aren't subscribed. Make sure to exorcise the subscribe button, as it helps out the channel. Without further ado, following the strongest sorcerer in history, he's seen riding his dragon summon, saving his students and the village from hordes of monsters. But one night, he was betrayed by the higher ups, having sent one of his own students after him, he had no choice but to yield to his precious student. Realizing his weaknesses, he vows to be more cunning in his next life. In a different world where humans and demons exist with magical abilities, we see two brothers gather around the youngest child, as their father attempts to determine the youngest's magical capabilities. In the home of Lampruges, a clan of mages, our protagonist, Seika Lampruge the third son, is deemed to have no magical capabilities, as his mother didn't either, but he has otherworldly spiritual affinities. Testing out his new body, Seika begins to mimic creating Shikigami. Using leaves as paper substitute, Seika is able to convert leaves to mice. As the middle child Gly spots Seika all alone, Gly attempts to educate Seika on how he should be addressed, resorting to physical violence. Before Gly can attack, Seika commands crows to swarm Gly, alerting Roft, who shoos away the birds. Noticing something suspicious the older brother takes Gly to be patched up. Now seven years old, Seika accepts that he will not be pampered like his other brothers, but has learned a lot about the world. Having slaved away all day, Seika had managed to create paper, which will act as his talismans moving forward. Checking his closet, Seika realizes something is missing, only to have a servant, Yifa knock on the door. Having found Seika's lost jacket, Seika deduces that Gly right on cue Gly appears, demanding Yifa get back to work, mocking Seika for having free time as he doesn't have to study any magic theory, unlike Gly who will be attending the Imperial Lodonia Magic Academy. Knowing Seika has no chance of entering, Gly states that Seika will be lucky to even join the army. Cut off, their father utters that he'll assist with Gly's training. As Roft Gly and father head to train, Seika asks if he can watch. Stepping up, Roft begins to chant a wind spell, sending a wind slash towards a rock. Next Gly cast a fireball, landing a hit on another rock. Wanting to mock Seika, Gly asks Seika to attempt a spell, hoping to embarrass Seika in front of father, but Seika accepts, shocking Roft. Seeing this as an opportunity, Seika states that he had promised not to seek strength as that will only blind him, and that the strong had always taken advantage of the weak. Conjuring an image, Seika makes use of his spiritual energy, casting Oni fireball burning a bright blue, and blazingly destroying a rock. With everyone surprised, Gly attempts to brush off Seika's abilities, but father mentions that a special sorcerer even without mana is still able to use magic, and even make the color of the spell change. Wanting to learn magic, Seika is rejected, as someone with no magic had ever become great, but father still has hope, stating that he'll give Seika a tutor starting this year. Beginning to study magic, and monitor his siblings with his hidden talismans, Seika eventually reaches the age of 11. In his past life, Seika sealed away several powerful Ayakashi monsters, and forced them to serve him. Knowing this, he intends to bring them to this world, but first he needs to test his theory with a weak one first. Using a talisman, Seika opens a door, calling for Kudajitsune, but what appears is a little girl. Happy to see Seika, she leaps into his arms, which he finds weird as Yuk chatting, Seika realizes it's most likely his weak spiritual energy, but nonetheless is happy to reunite with Yuki. Wanting to serve her master, Seika reveals that he doesn't need anything at the moment, prompting Yuki to revert to a smaller pet, standing on Seika's shoulders. The next day, Yifa is seen scolded by Gly, who she had spilled water all over. Angered, he realizes he can use the opportunity to take advantage of her, but before he can demand anything further, Seika intervenes, prompting Gly to swing. Catching Gly's fist, Seika forces Gly to retreat for now, putting Yifa at ease. Outside the two run into a baby carbuncle, who had been attacked. Wanting to help it, Seika asks for Yifa to turn away as Seika plucks the creature's hair, enchanting a talisman, and instantly healing the creature. Amazed, Yifa begins praising Seika, but Seika knows Yifa is hiding talents of her own. Attempting to play it off, Yifa realizes that Seika is aware of her eyes, which can see more than what Seika is capable of. Giving in, 
Yifa reveals that she promised her deceased mother to never tell, but she can see spirits, and they helped her find Seika's jacket previously. Also for some reason, spirits tend to gather around things, but for Seika they all seem to be avoiding him. Changing topics, Seika asks if Yifa can command the spirits, which she can only remember one time, where she told the spirits to stop messing with her. Impressed, Seika realizes that something similar in his past life was possible, and he had spent time searching for someone who could control spirits in this world, which happened to be someone so close. Asking if Yifa wants to learn magic, Yifa admits she has too low of a magic pool, but Seika creates a flame to test that. Begging a wind spirit to assist, Yifa after some attempts is able to extinguish the flame, which makes Seika want to nurture it. Several months pass by, as Seika continues to train with Yifa, who progressively extinguishes more and more flames. With Seika's twelfth birthday arriving, once again no one seems to care, and his father is not even present. After breakfast, Vlai and Roft offer to train Seika, in hopes that he'll be able to join the army, but a maid alerts them that their father had initially scared away a monster, but it seems to be heading in their direction. As the elder nude appears, Vlai runs away as Roft asks the maids and Seika to find safety, but Seika has other plans. Outside, Yifa and a junior maid is spotted by the creature, but before the creature can attack, Yifa subconsciously conjures a fire spell, buying her time to flee. Proud of Yifa, Seika steps up, luring the creature away. Leaping into the air, Seika casts a toxic spell, instantly killing and taming the creature. As everyone in the manor witnessed Seika's amazing feat, they all applaud him, which Seika states is all according to plan. Having achieved an amazing feat, even some skilled adventurers would struggle to do, all whilst Gly glared in jealousy at his brother. Wondering how Seika knew newts were weak to fire, Seika reveals to his father that he had read it in a book. Wanting to give Seika a reward, Seika reveals that he has reached the peak of his learning at home, and would like to excel further by enrolling at the Lodonia Magic Academy. Pondering for a bit, his father accepts, but he states that Seika must pass the entrance exam by himself, with no influence from his family. Agreeing, Seika asks for Yifa to accompany him, but his father denies, as Yifa supposedly has no magic capabilities. Wanting to show off Yifa's hard work, Seika hands Yifa a wand, asking for her to chant a fire. Imagining a future with Seika, Yifa nonchalantly ignites the room, casting a mid-level spell, shocking all the onlookers. Satisfied, father agrees to enroll Yifa, but Gly is clearly against any of this. Stating that a family has never sent two children to the same occupation before, Gly argues that Seika is bound to fail, but his father drops the bomb, by revealing that Gly will be joining the army. Therefore his physical talent would be best suited for the army. Refusing to accept this, Gly challenges Seika to a duel, with the winner attending the magic school. With their mother against the duel, Seika ultimately accepts, with the duel set for tomorrow. Having returned to his room, Seika continues to prepare talismans, all whilst Yuki asks if he would kill Gly. Answering no, the two are interrupted by Luft, who wishes to speak with Seika. Apologizing, Luft hands Seika a late birthday gift, a glass pen. Knowing that Seika will win tomorrow, Luft asks that he take it easy on Gly, and that Luft is proud to be Seika's older brother. Admiring the pen with Yuki, Seika realizes something is approaching, asking for Yuki to hide. Seeing Gly outside, Seika realizes Gly is too impatient to wait for tomorrow. Demanding to know when Seika had shown interest in going to school, Gly states that they should duel until one person is unable to fight, immediately casting a mid-level spell, as Seika warns Gly about the dangers or powerful magic. As the smoke clears up, Gly is shocked to see Seika. Seen enough, Seika pulls out a talisman, chanting a curse, and paralyzing Gly in place. Tugging at the human-shaped talisman, Seika is able to replicate the action on Gly, whose arm is almost ripped off. Seeing Gly defeated, Seika relinquishes the curse, putting Gly to sleep. Six months ago, Seika is seen communicating with Bonds, one of his summons, asking for him to search around the forest for an elder newt. Having concealed Bonzi's presence, Seika was able to put on a scene to show to his father, and luckily it has all been going according to plan. As Yuki wonders why Seika is holding back so much, Seika reveals that he had learned his lesson from his previous life, vowing to live among the weak and help them. 
With departure day arriving, Luft comes to wish Seika off, noticing Yifa still exhausted from studying all night. To ease their worries, Luft mentions that the ride to the school takes several days, therefore they have extra time to study. Just like that, they have gifting Yifa a necklace. Seika sets Yifa's next goal, to be able to consistently control spirits, and that he benefits personally, every time Yifa grows. Not used to horse-drawn carriages, Seika gets sick, but when Yifa reveals the lustrous town, Seika forgets about the pain. Following Seika's father, it's revealed that Seika was actually the child of Gilbert, the younger brother of Gly and Luft's father. Apparently, Gilbert had become an adventurer after leaving school, but had gone missing in the demon territory leaving Seika behind. Believing Seika to be half-demon, Gly's father had tested Seika for magical traits but none. Father had known that Seika was special, using unique techniques to mimic magic, hence this was one of the reasons why father had prepared Seika at school rather than in the army, in fear of what Seika would become. Back with Seika, we see Yifa and him arrive at their inn, as Yifa teases Seika for being unable to handle carriages. Now officially Seika's servant, Yifa wonders if she should spend the night with Seika, but Seika mistakes her flirting for her being hungry, prompting Yifa to leave. Now alone, Yuki appears, angry at Yifa for trying to flirt with her master. When Seika refuses to believe such a thing, Yuki states that Yifa is clearly in love with Seika, but Seika once again brushes it off. With the two arriving at the academy, Seika notes the interesting type of auras around him. An instructor begins to call students over to measure their magic affinities, Seika and Yifa are chosen first. Revealing his family name, other students make note of Seika, hoping to befriend him. But when it's time for Yifa to introduce herself, she reveals herself as Seika's slave. Bringing out an orb, the instructor asks to check the two's magical affinities, which Seika notes that in this world, fire, water, earth and wind are the basic types. As Yifa goes first, it's revealed that she has weak fire and wind affinities, but when it's Seika's turn, it seems he doesn't have any magic affinity, as expected. Seeing Seika with no magic, other students begin to hate Seika, believing Seika will use his noble ties to cheat his way into the school. Suddenly Amiu, a red-haired commoner shuts everyone up, cutting to the front of the line. As she places her hand on the orb, she's revealed to have all four basic affinities, leaving everyone stunned. As Amiu turns to leave, Seika thanks her for standing up for him, but she states that although she stood up for him, she still despises Seika also believing that Seika will use his noble ties to enroll. As Amiu leaves, Seika realizes that Amiu resembles the girl that was sent to betray him in his past life. Having sat their written test, Yifa is saddened that she didn't feel so good after the exams, which Seika attempts to cheer her up, encouraging her to do good in the practicals. In the corner of his eyes, Amiu passes by wielding a sword, which piques Seika's interest, as she also has four elemental affinities. Moving outside, the instructor begins the practical exam, placing four targets, one for each element, and asking the students to strike the targets with their respective elements. As most students are only capable of a single magic type, we see students only attack a single target. Being called Yifa steps up, casting a mid-level fire spell, completely erasing the surface of the target, surprising the instructor, as the target was supposedly reinforced. Next Yifa cast a new mid-level wind spell, poking holes in the target, surprising even Seika. Next up is Seika, who cast his blue flames on the target, shocking everyone, but his flames continue to burn indefinitely. Next up is an earth spell, having identified the target to be made of granite, Seika is able to infuse the granite with his key, giving the effect of an earth spell being cast on the target. Finally, for water Seika sneaks a talisman, chanting a spell to have ice be formed around the target. Having never figured out wind, light or dark magic, Seika leaves it at that. That afternoon, the practical instructor speaks with a female teacher, asking if she knows the magical capabilities of Yifa and Seika, which the female instructor says they should have little to no magical capabilities. Additionally, she reveals that Amiu was far more impressive, having not only four elemental affinities, but also light and dark magic making her possibly the mythic hero. With the results coming out, Yifa begs Seika to not leave her. Looking for his name, Seika is pleased to be ranked third, having maxed out his written scores. But Yifa is more shocked, 
placing second above Seika, due to her astounding physical scores. Finally Amiu is ranked first, which Seika had anticipated. Receiving a letter of invitation, Yifa wonders if she will be able to serve Seika, but Seika reassures her she should focus on being a student. Whilst walking, Seika notices an ominent feeling, which Yifa recognizes as the dark element, resonating from a forest. Passing some trees, the two discover a ritual circle, which seems suspicious, but they brush off as a school activity, as they head to the entrance ceremony. Munching on some food, Seika watches as Amiu gives a speech stating her reason for being here is to get stronger. Right on cue, some lesser demons break into the building, searching for something. As the demons attempt to harm a student, Seika attempts to step in, but Amiu beats him to it. Slicing at the demon, Amiu follows up casting a wind spell, halting the demon's movements. Asking everyone to run or fight, Seika begins surveying the area using his talismans, spotting a demon around the previously mentioned ritual circle. Asking Yifa to run if there is danger, Seika switches places with a talisman. Under the brightly lit moonlight, Seika begins recounting a poem, as he emerges from the darkness. Pondering on the beauty of the poem, Seika begins to question the demon at hand, but the demon simply wonders why a mere child is here. Summoning several weaker demons, the greater demon is impressed, when Seika dispatches two, sealing away one for himself. Stepping up, Dol Galios summons several blades, introducing himself as an earth and fire caster. Seika's attack is thwarted as Gull is able to see his talismans. Following up, Gull incinerates Seika's surrounding talismans, tossing his blade at Seika. Noticing the suspiciously slow blade, Seika is cut, realizing Gull had teleported his blade, attempting to kill Seika. Slashing his blade, Gull creates a fire slash, forcing Seika to jump, but Gull teleports behind Seika, ripping away Seika's arm. Impressed with Seika's resolve, Gull reveals that he was sent to track down the hero, and today he had found the hero Amiu. With the conversation coming to a close, Gull sends several projectiles at Seika, landing the final blow with his own hands. Wishing to have fought a little longer, Gull is shocked to hear Seika's voice, turning, only to realize Seika is unharmed. Tossing a blade at Seika, Gull notices his blade disappear, demanding to know what happened. When Seika reveals he's able to erase any object he chooses, Gull gets angered, stating he will silence Seika for lying about his strength. Tossing several projectiles, Gull watches as Seika unleashes a tsunami of water, filling the forest with water. Having used his teleportation magic, Gull appears behind Seika, swiping at him, but is electrocuted by Seika's summon. Letting his guard down, Seika is impaled from behind, but had used this to grab onto Gull. Asking if Gull had ever questioned the fundamentals of the world, Gull replies that he is still able to fight, as long as he can get rid of Seika's talismans, which Seika responds by revealing his endless amount of talismans. Putting an end to the battle, Seika brings out his most powerful summon, Ryu, a dragon who swiftly devours Gull. Suddenly, Seika's dragon summon begins rampaging, forcing Seika to return Ryu realizing that his current body is too weak to impose mastery over the dragon. As Yuki comes out of hiding, the two head back to the dining hall, Seika is pleased to see nobody is hurt, including Yifa. But most importantly, Seika witnesses Amiu finish off the remaining demons, deeming to make her the strongest in the world, and having her trust him. With a month passing since the incident, Seika has set a mission of making Amiu the center of attention, as he lives a normal life to ensure he'll never meet the same fate as his previous life. Saying hello to Amiu, Seika is flat out told to never speak to her, which makes Seika freeze, as he can't remember the last time he made friends. Continuing to class, Seika and Yifa are surprised by a pot floating above them, forcing Seika to teleport himself and Seika away from the pot. Wondering if he should take a sample of the mysterious liquid in the pot, they realize that Professor Cordell was conducting an experiment. Mixing monster blood and boiling, only to accidentally have the pot fly away when he used dark magic. Apparently, dark magic controls gravity, space and time, whereas light controls lighting and light itself. But it's suspicious how Cordell has affinity for both polar opposite types. Heading to Ms. Karen's class, Seika learns that every new school year, the top two students, Yifa and Amiu, 
are tasked with delivering a new student roster to the Lodonia Forest as an offering. This seems dangerous, as the forest is where Seika fought Gull, therefore Seika has Yifa refuse, making Seika, the next possible candidate. Chatting privately, Seika apologizes to Yifa for taking her position, but Yifa clearly couldn't care less, realizing Seika had planned to grow closer to Amiu. Getting jealous, Yifa wonders if Amiu is Seika's type, stating that she'll get stronger if he likes strong girls. But Seika states that he simply wants to be friends with Amiu, putting Yifa at ease. With the ceremony day arriving, Ms. Karen hands Amiu the roster list, as Seika and Amiu head into the forest. Questioning Seika's reason for coming, Seika states that he wants to simply chat, but Amiu believes that Seika is doing naughty things with his Yi. Feeling something, the two stumble onto a ritual circle, where they are teleported to a dungeon, where they are ambushed by three lizard men. Immediately springing into action, Amiu appears behind the three, burning the three lizards. Letting her guard down, a greater lizard appears, forcing Seika to cast a rock spell, killing it. Beginning to explore the dungeon, Amiu mentions that most professional adventurers would deny venturing through undiscovered dungeons, and that they should be careful. Using his talismans to light up the area, Amiu is impressed, but quickly hides her joy. Using his talismans to mark their route, and signal his Shikiagmai on the surface to track them, Amiu senses approaching danger, charging at the horde of monsters. But having underestimated them, Amiu takes a brutal blow, and is knocked out. Unleashing a powerful summon, Seika calls a giant centipede, Seika allows the creature to run rampant, as it thrives in tight spaces. Waking up, Amiu notices her wounds are all healed, but her headache remains. Having healed all of Amiu's physical wounds, Seika puts up a barrier, deducing that Amiu has been marked by a curse. Inspecting Amiu's body, Seika believes the curse is far more complex, and that she most likely had been cursed from afar. Using a talisman to replace Amu's presence. Taking the opportunity, Amu asks if Seika had kissed Yifa, or if he had touched her, but Seika states no. Uttering that Yifa is like family to him, Amu begins to laugh, but learns that Seika is an illegitimate child of a noble, and that Yifa means far more to him, than just his slave. Opening up, Amu says her mother is part of the guild, and her father is an adventurer. Additionally, ever since she was born, Amu's love for fighting had always been apparent, making her stand out from the rest. In one of her past adventures, many of her party members had died, but she seemed numb to this. Coming to the school, she had hoped to get stronger, but had secretly wished to become normal, but this didn't seem possible. Giving Amu some words of wisdom, Seika states that not all people are meant to be the same, and that if someone doesn't fit in, they simply have to search for a place where they do. Happy to know that Seika doesn't think she is weird, Amiu forces Seika to keep her secret. With both heading deeper into the dungeon, the two enjoy their time, killing and slaying countless creatures, eventually stumbling upon a boss room. Recognizing it as a naga, the two head in, knowing if they defeat it, they can leave the dungeon. Aggroing the creature, Seika realizes it can spit poison. With Amiu drawing the creature's attention, Seika shoots a metal rod into the naga allowing Amiu to follow up and kill the Naga. Jumping into Seika's arms, Amiu mentions how happy it is to kill a dungeon boss for the first time, but instantly retracts her joy, out of embarrassment. It's revealed that Seika had found the exit long ago, and could escape any time, but wanted to give Amiu some experience fighting. Checking out the corpse, Seika pulls out a mithril sword, handing it to Amiu, whilst he keeps a mysterious ring. Leaving the dungeon, the two promise to go on more adventures in the future, but first they have to report to the teachers about the dungeon in the forest, and the creatures they slayed. Sadly the ritual circle had disappeared, so there was no way of tracking the perpetrator. Visiting Professor Cordell, Seika reveals that he knows Cordell is a traitor, as it was suspicious how a demon like Gull could sneak into the school. Deducing Seika as the person that killed Gull, Seika is impressed, asking for Cordell to reveal his true form. But Cordell is human, working for the devils as a spy, having created a new light spell that is able to curse people from afar, giving them being so close to killing Amiu, Cordell attempts to attack Seika, but Seika states that he had figured out the curse's condition, that being the target had to have been covered in demon blood. Bringing out a captured demon, 
Seika covers himself in the demon's blood transferring Amu's curse onto him. Then he begins chanting a curse of his own, repelling his newly acquired curse, back onto Cordell, leaving the professor to bleed out on the floor. Now with a threat gone, Seika chooses to give his dungeon ring to Yifa, knowing that the ring will make Yifa stronger. With a new year already starting, we see Amu grow closer to Yifa and Seika, thanking the two for spending time with her and helping her study. Noting that there had been no more demon attacks, Seika is seen putting talismans all over campus to prepare for a repeat incident like last year. Seika is suddenly called by the vice principal to have him and Yifa visit the principal office the next morning. Pondering the meaning of this, a girl continues to observe the trio. Heading to the office the next evening, the two realize they've never actually seen the principal before, believing the position to be vacant. Laying eyes on Seika, the principal is immediately able to tell Seika is mature, whilst Seika is shocked to see the principal as a demi-human, which the principal takes as an insult, prompting Seika to apologize for addressing the principal as so. Seeing Seika, the principal of handedly mentions his uncle, but Seika was unaware he had an uncle. Getting to the point, the principal asks for Seika or Yifa to enter a sword fighting tournament with a new first year, Mabel Crane. Jealous that she wasn't offered to fight, Amu wonders why now of all years does the magical school get to participate in a physical combat tournament. Seika reasons that it would be best for him to go, and that it would help the school's reputation. Additionally, the principal had asked Seika or Yifa because the upperclassmen are all busy with exams, but Yifa did mention Seika had a reputation, having already been through various tough jobs. Still sour about not being invited, Amu learns that winners get money, but also the chance of being a royal guard which Amu is against, as she would prefer fighting monsters in a dungeon, over standing by all day. Comforting Amu, Amu ultimately concedes, but one thing is still suspicious, as Yifa was chosen over Amu, since most people know Yifa would never be able to harm another human, which makes joining a tournament unreasonable. Walking through the school, Amu continues to bash Mabel, believing her to be a noble, using others to benefit for themselves. But Mabel overhears her, stating that Amu has no idea of the hardships Mabel has been through. Calling Amu all talk for someone weak, Amu becomes triggered, challenging Mabel to a duel. Demanding some practice swords, Amu tosses a blade to Mabel, asking to settle who's stronger once and for all. With both taking stances, Seika notes how both are showing off their confidence with a blade. Wanting to see Mabel's potential, Seika signals for the two to fight. With Amu lunging at Mabel, Mabel is able to parry her blade, going on the offensive, which catches Amu off guard. Having destroyed Amu's blade, Mabel is deemed the winner, walking off, but not before asserting her dominance. But Amu calls Mabel out for using magic, which Mabel calls it part of the duel, turning to Seika and telling him to take the tournament seriously. Checking up on Amu, we see Amu set her goal on something. A while later, Seika is seen on a carriage heading to the capital with Mabel, but they are accompanied by Yifa and Amu. Wanting to see Mabel's true potential, Amu had snuck out of class, which Seika couldn't help, and will share a lodge with Yifa. On the way, everyone learns that Mabel is the same age as Seika and Amu, but Yifa is a year older than everyone, explaining her more matured body. Seeing others having fun, Mabel can't help, but detest them, as they aren't mature enough for her. Wanting to say something, Seika holds himself back, which Mabel adds that Seika too is not mature enough. Having arrived, Mabel has disappeared, and Seika is in poor shape, but Seika still soldiers on. Looking at the brackets, Seika realizes that he'll have to fight Mabel, eventually, which is weird to say the least. Asking if Amu recognizes any fighters, Amu states that no strong adventurers would be caught participating. Seen enough, Seika has to be alone wanting to figure the reason for why he was chosen over others, to participate in a sword tournament. Before leaving, Amu makes jokes about Seika doing naughty things, which Seika is forced to brush off. With the tournament beginning, it's revealed that half of participants are mages, and that someone loses if they are unconscious, knocked out of the ring, surrender or their amulet is broken. With Seika as the first match, we see his opponent, a mercenary Dennis Regan, supposedly the strongest in his guild, but is also a disowned noble, for bad behavior. Additionally, Dennis is purely a swordsman who loves beating up the weak, 
especially mages, believing that mages are too slow to cast their spells. Knowing that he'll win, Dennis thinks of Seika, but Seika says he'll easily handle Dennis swiftly. As the match begins, Dennis impales Seika, but Seika faints with a talisman, appearing behind and blowing Dennis out of the ring. Knowing he didn't kill him, Seika shows no care to scum, as he heads out. Chatting with Yuki, Seika agrees that he needs to tone it down, if he doesn't want to stand out. Arriving back with Amiu and Yifa, Seika thanks the girls for cheering him on, as they await the next match. Bellum a water mage versus Kyle a warrior with no information, meaning he could be either mage or swordsman. With the bout beginning, Kyle immobilizes Bellum, slowly walking to his opponent. Wondering why Bellum isn't moving, Seika has a closer look, watching as Bellum is stabbed by Kyle, winning him the match and impressing onlookers. With no one knowing what just transpired, Seika deduces that Kyle most likely wields an evil eye, and has killed countless people, with Seika's next opponent enchanting their golem with several anti-magic spells. Seika is forced to swiftly bring out a summon, which easily dismantles the golem, appearing as if Seika had cast a wind spell. With the opponent forced to surrender, Seika notes that no summoners are allowed, in the tournament, and that it should be fine, as long as he's able to hide such summons. Returning to Amiu and Yifa, Seika notes Yifa's worried state, not wanting Seika to suffer the same fate at the hands of Kyle, the killer. Reassuring that he will not lose, Amiu adds that she can't picture Seika losing, but at this rate, Seika will be forced to join the royal guards. But Seika says he'll simply refuse, putting Amiu at ease. As Mabel is scheduled to fight next, against Howlow, a powerful earth wizard, Seika watches their fight closely. As Howlow shoots several rocks at Mabel, Mabel unsheathes her blades easily dicing the incoming projectiles, forcing Howlow to begin using mid-tier spells. Seeing Mabel approaching, Howlow attempts to slow her down, using several rock walls, but Mabel is able to infuse her daggers with gravity magic allowing them to cut right through the earth pieces. Amiu realizes that Mabel is enchanting the daggers, the moment she tosses them, as they would be too heavy to throw if enchanted before. Additionally, Seika notes Mabel's powerful sword style, as it seems like a complicated style for a kid to learn. Having closed the distance, Mabel is able to disarm the sorcerer, forcing him to concede, crowning Mabel the hero Mabel. Wondering why Mabel is called the hero, Seika learns that in the past, there was a hero called Mabel, who wields similar weapons. That night, we see a green-haired boy attempt to send a messenger pigeon, but Seika intervenes, revealing that he knows the boy is a demon spy, and refusing to admit it, the boy attempts to leave, but not before pulling a knife on Seika attacking him. Having anticipated this, Seika is forced to restrain the boy, whilst giving him another chance to confess. But the boy refuses, welcoming Seika to torture him, but Seika has other plans. Bringing out a summon, Satori, a monkey-like creature that simply glares at the green hair, Seika reveals that the creature will read the boy's soul. Beginning to read the green-haired mind, Seika begins asking the boy questions, as Satori begins speaking the boy's thoughts. Learning of the boy's origins and who's hiring him, Seika confirms that the boy is a demon spy but runs into some blockage as the boy attempts to jumble up his own thoughts. Changing topics to the hero, Seika learns that the boy is following the hero Mabel Crane, as she fits all the criteria of the prophecy, and that other demon spies that infiltrate Seika's school, was able to confirm her capabilities, right before they went missing. Satisfied with the information, Seika releases the boy, but does not let him go, allowing Satori to feed on the boy, as Seika encases them in a noise-canceling box. Turning to Seika, Satori begins reading his master's mind, but Seika warns the creature to stop, or he will kill it, returning the summon. Chatting with Yuki, Seika reveals that Mabel is simply a fake hero, the school created, to draw attention away from Amiu, the real hero. The reason the demons are so misinformed is because Seika killed all their spies in the school. Since Mabel is keeping Amiu safe, Seika has no reason to interfere, but he's curious about Mabel's true identity still wondering why the principal sent Seika to accompany Mabel. The next day, the evil eye Kyle, and a four elemental knight Reynas both winning their matches. Reynas wishes Seika the best, as Seika swiftly defeats a necromancer opponent, as Mabel defeats hers. Running into Mabel, Seika congratulates Mabel, 
But Mabel asks for Seika to forfeit, not wanting to waste time. But Seika refuses, forcing Mabel to show off how desperate she is for winning. Not wanting to hurt Seika, Mabel leaves, as several participants begin forfeiting before their matches, forcing the tournament to announce a special match between Kyle and Reynas. Beginning the duel, Reynas immediately uses light magic, casting a protection against Kyle's evil eye, but this doesn't phase Kyle. Slowly walking towards Reynas, Reynas is forced to shoot different projectiles, but none slow down Kyle, who is using gravity magic to fortify himself. With no choice, Reyna unleashes an army of golems, but Kyle unveils his dark magic, easily dismantling the army of golems. Taking the opportunity to close the gap, Reyna swings at Kyle, but Kyle stabs Reyna's shadow, freezing him on the spot. Before Kyle is able to cut Reyna down, the match is awarded to Kyle. That night, Seika realizes that the final battles are tomorrow, and that he should rest up, prompting Yuki to change to her human form, wanting to rest next to her master. But Seika senses danger, pulling Yuki aside, as Seika greets Mabel. Dodging a dagger, Seika throws himself at Mabel, as the two fly out a window. Attempting to bind Mabel, Seika tricks Mabel, blasting her back, as he commands her strength. As an outsider checks on the noise, Mabel takes the chance to disappear. As the moonlight lights up the sky, we see Mabel reminiscing about her mysterious brother, only to stand guard as Seika appears. Wanting to just talk, Seika mentions how he has noticed how uncomfortable Mabel gets, wielding daggers, and that she probably prefers a larger object. Wondering how he knows, Seika utters that he is quite sad tonight, as he doesn't like how there are two moons in the sky, as a single one, would be more of an elegant scene. Realizing Seika is quite weird, Mabel asks why Seika is here, if he doesn't want to fight. Reiterating that he simply wants to talk, Seika says he knows Mabel doesn't truly want to kill him, leading Mabel to reveal that she simply wanted Seika to forfeit, even willing to take off some of Seika's limbs, assuming he would be able to heal himself. But she knows she is stronger, but doesn't want to have to go all out. Not satisfied, Seika reveals that he knows Mabel is pretending to be the hero, to protect Amiu, but still wonders why she joined the tournament. Reluctant, she states that her whole purpose is to fight in the tournament, only to die in the hands of Kyle, to fake the death of the hero, to the demons. Apparently, both Mabel and Kyle were orphans trained to become valuable mercenaries. The whole purpose of Kyle being in the tournament, is to see if Kyle has been properly brainwashed, as he has undergone some experimentation, which intends to strip Kyle of his emotions, leaving him with the ability to only follow orders. As his graduation mission, he must kill Mabel. Adding that she wants to duel Kyle, because she wants to avenge her brother, who Kyle slayed, but Seika cuts her off, as he knows Kyle is her brother. Sitting next to Seika, Mabel realizes that she'll be disposed of, for not completing her missions, but if it's the last thing she does, she at least wants to put her own brother to rest. Seeing the full picture, Seika decides that he will fight Mabel's brother, but Mabel states that only she can stand up to him, leading Seika to state that he is the absolute strongest. Seeing Seika not back down, Mabel can't help but respect him, stating that she will fight him tomorrow with her full strength. With the next day arriving, we see Mabel has brought her real weapon, a much larger cleave, which impresses Seika. As the match begins, Mabel disappears, bringing her axe onto Seika from behind. Having missed, she makes use of the rubble to close the distance, but once again, Seika evades with his talismans. Attempting to bind Mabel with vines, Seika notes how easily she is moving, giving Seika an idea. Placing a talisman on Mabel's axe changes the weight of her axe, forcing her to relinquish it. Next Seika binds Mabel, using Mercury, which ensures she can't escape. Seeing Mabel completely helpless, the judges decide to end the duel, in favor of Seika, meaning he'll be the one to face Kyle. With tension in the stadium rising, Seika chats with Kyle, seeing if Kyle has a change of heart about wanting to slaughter his own sister. But Kyle seems unfazed, as all he cares about is fulfilling his commands. With the match beginning, Kyle attempts to hypnotize Seika, but Seika casts a red smoke cloud, blocking Kyle and the audience's vision. Tossing several spells at Kyle, Seika is unable to do any damage, attempting to bind Kyle, but he simply retaliates with his dark magic. Bored of Kyle, Seika unleashes Uchioni, a minotaur that towers over Kyle, 
offering the kid a chance to surrender. But since Kyle feels no emotions, he strikes Uchioni, but and as Kyle lays there unconscious, Seika notices Kyle being infected by a curse, putting up a barrier to cut off the curse's connection. Checking up on Kyle, Seika listens to Kyle's last words, which enrages Seika, as some other Cures user is toying with his friends. Unveiling his countless talismans, Seika begins chanting a powerful spell, intended to revive Kyle, but Yuki cries for Seika to not reveal his true power. Bringing up how Seika passed in his past life, Yuki is able to knock some sense into him, forcing Seika to stop the spell. As the tournament ends, Seika hides Kyle's body, as he's crowned the champion, all whilst denying to join the royal guards. Having preserved Kyle's body, Seika is able to show Mabel the place where he buried Kyle, as he now knows Mabel is actually her true name. As a parting message, Seika relays a message, from before Kyle passed, which forces Mabel to break down, as she's finally able to accept her brother's death. Wondering where she'll go, Mabel learns that Seika intends to have her continue as a student, and that he will make it happen. Rejoining Amiu and Yifa, Amiu suddenly challenges Mabel, wanting a rematch, but this time with real swords, and the loser is the one that has their sword broken. With Seika signaling to start, Amiu shows off her new skill, enchanting her blade with gravity, magic shocking Mabel. Knowing about Mabel's past, Amiu reveals that she knows Mabel still cares about her brother, and that she could sometimes rely on others, hoping to grow closer to the shy Mabel. As the gang head back to school, Seika privately chats to the principal, revealing that he knows that the principal had bought Mabel, and had intentionally planned to have Seika go, and win the whole tournament. Having seen Mabel at her worst, the principal can't help but wonder, why such a talented girl had to have such an realizing that the principal is far more observant, having noticed Seika's endless power, she had purposely chosen Seika as the central piece of the plan. Additionally, the principal promises to keep Mabel safe, as long as she chooses to stay at the school, which pleases Seika. Back with the gang, Seika is seen admiring Mabel's natural white hair, as he stops Mabel from running off, and avoiding her studies. With summer break starting, the gang discuss plans, only for Seika to reveal how he's tasked with investigating a dragon, in the kingdom of Asteria. As his father had given Seika an interesting mission, Amiu asks if she could accompany him but Seika rejects her, stating that she should visit her parents every chance she gets. Next, Mabel asks if she could join, but Seika reasons that it would be safest for Mabel to remain on school grounds. Realizing Yifa hasn't said a word, Seika asks if Yifa would like to accompany him, which Yifa blushingly accepts. Suddenly a man and a woman enter the room, whilst the man makes note of the academy's old structure, he holds himself back from commenting further, as he locks eyes on Seika. Introducing himself as Cecilio, the crown prince of Asteria, Seika immediately graces his honor, apologizing for having the prince come all the way, but Cecilio reassures Seika it was no hassle, and that he wanted to see the school for himself. Spotting Yifa off to the side, Cecilio mistakes Yifa for a noble, having such feminine features, offering her to become one of his wives. But Yifa apologizes, as she can't do anything without her master's permission. Understanding, Cecilio offers to buy Yifa from Seika, but Cecilio's escort reasons it would be best to continue chatting elsewhere. Thanking Seika for taking on the investigation, Cecilio reveals that the dragons in Asteria had always been civil, but recently there has been some unrest, causing them to damage farmland and attack livestock. Wanting to know more about the history of Asteria, Seika learns that legend says that the first dragon was birthed by a human, and that Seika is free to investigate if he pleases. Before parting ways, Cecilio invites both Yifa and Seika to a meal, but his escort Lisa holds him back, known walking through the school, Seika is pulled aside by Mabel and Amiu, wanting to be caught up in his conversation with the prince. Reassuring the girls, that he won't let the prince have Yifa, unless she herself wants to join the prince's harem, oblivious to how Yifa loves Seika. Two days later, Seika and Yifa accompany the prince back to his kingdom, but Seika looks ill. But still grateful to the prince, as Seika gets to explore different regions with a reason, prompting Yifa to mention how the prince offered to have her ride with him, but Yifa denied, skeptical that royalty would want a slave riding with them. With several days passing, Seika and Yifa arrive at the capital, as they notice a greater dragon, soar past them, inching ever so close. 
A summoner suddenly conjures a tiger, scarring the dragon, before it's able to do any more damage. But as the dragon flies off, the summon locks eyes with Yifa, pouncing on her, forcing Seika to step in. Restraining the summon, Seika prepares to finish the creature, but the summoner retracts the summon. Revealed to be Zekt, a mercenary Cecilio hired to slay the dragon, Seika asks for Cecilio to reconsider hiring people that could possibly scare the dragon off to other regions. But Zekt butts in, stating that he'll be able to slay the creature, but Psycat states that he wasn't able to keep the creature under control, warning Zekt that if the creature was ever summoned around Seika, he will put it down himself. Before their argument could escalate further, Cecilio breaks them up, chatting to Seika privately. Wanting to know if the Queen of the Kingdom knows about Cecilio wanting to slay a dragon, a symbol of the country, the prince reveals that no one knows, but it looks like there is no choice. Before Seika can add, he holds back, knowing that he had overstepped, turning to Yifa. Questioning why Yifa didn't defend herself, she reminds Yifa how important it is to stay calm, as someday Se seeing Yifa being scolded, the prince attempts to pity her, but Seika presses on, knowing that it's normal to freeze up, but a push in the right direction is better than nothing. Apparently in his old life, Seika had witnessed his friend devoured by his dragon summon, which had allowed him to muster up the courage to tame such a powerful creature. Heading to a library, Yifa apologizes for not being able to help read, learning Seika had picked up the olden language when he was younger. Reading the books, Seika reads that a mysterious human had summoned a male long ago, but there were no signs that the dragon was ever compliant with humans. Next the male dragon met in Asteria, where it mated with a female dragon, giving birth to some offspring. Since dragons need a way to replenish their magic, they've been feeding on livestock, but apparently not too long after giving birth, the female dragon passed, leaving only the male and its offspring. Noting something suspicious, Seika reasons it would be best to check out these dragons personally, but Yifa wonders if Seika is able to take on a dragon. Agreeing with the danger, Seika states that Yifa will stay behind. That night, Yif knocks on Seika's room, asking for advice, as the prince wants to see her in his room. Knowing the scummy prince is after Yifa's body, Seika says she can spend the night with him, if she's too scared to return to her room. Accepting the offer, Seika and Yifa lay in the same bed, facing away from each other, as Seika asked Yifa if she would like to stay and join the prince's harem. Shooting down the offer, Seika continues to ask about Yifa's feelings for the prince, which Yifa mistakes for Seika wanting to get rid of her. Apologizing for her shortcomings, Seika says that she should reconsider, if she truly wants to be with him, or the prince. The next morning, Seika questions the prince on his reason for making advances on his slave, but the prince reveals that there is something about Yifa that draws him to her, and it's not just her looks. Disgusted, Seika reveals that he will be climbing the mountain to investigate the dragons, which the prince is reluctant to allow. Telling Seika to be safe, Yifa watches as Seika ventures towards the mountain, only to be called by Liza to have a private chat. Wondering if Yifa is truly contempt with being Seika's slave her entire life, Liza reveals that Yifa gives off an aura of her race, the elves, and that Yifa is a descendant of the elves herself. Questioning Seika's origins, Elves gets Yifa to reveal that she doesn't know who Seika's mother is, and that she could be a demon, explaining his demonic aura. Afraid that Yifa may be harmed, Elves offers Yifa to join Cecilio's harem. Back with Seika, we see he has been able to swiftly scale the mountain having used his centipede summon. Greeting a dragon, Seika is able to block the dragon's breath, prompting it to dive at Seika, which he dodges. Bringing out a summon, Kanaki Gigi, a little wood creature, lands on the dragon's head, letting out a horrendous cry, which forces the dragon onto the ground. Bringing out a net, Seika is able to successfully pin the dragon down, as it would have been too dangerous, if the dragon was caught mid-air, and injured itself. Heading to what the dragon was guarding, Seika reveals that the dragon is currently male, but it was originally female, having changed its sex, like fish adapting to the environment. Seeing the massive egg, Seika begins rotating the egg, as he begins to piece together the history of the town. Back with Yifa, we see her taken to a location housing the prince's harem, which is not what it seems. Revealed to be an academy, meant to educate and train girls, to help bring out their full potential, and possibly one day be a fitting wife for the prince. 
The current queen is a very intelligent and prestigious woman. Therefore Cecilio is afraid that he himself would never be able to live up to her expectations. Therefore killing a dragon to gain praise, and rushing to marry a talented woman is the prince's ultimate life goal. Els adds that Cecilio isn't a bad person, having helped raise him from birth. Cutting to Seika, we see him heating up the egg, as if he was the mother, all attempting to head back, the dragon latches onto him, refusing to let him leave, seeing Seika as a love interest. Meeting up with Cecilio, Yifa watches as the prince asks for a second opinion on Yifa's worth as a slave. Next Cecilio asks a higher up to ready the money and the paperwork to make the transaction official. Realizing that things are happening too fast, Yifa states that she wants Seika to have the final say, as he's her master, but Kaleo presses on. Using his royal status, the prince states that he'll simply force Seika to sell Yifa to him, selling her to him, stating that it's too dangerous for Yifa to be hanging around Seika. Refusing, Cecilia wonders why Yifa is okay with being a slave, but Yifa states that she may be a slave, but she is more free than anyone, as long as she's with Seika. Just then, Cecilio's higher-up reasons it would be best to force her to join the harem, as they believe it would be best for her. Agreeing, the prince orders for his men to seize her, but Yifa begins to cast a spell, forcing Lisa to step in, and nullify it. Wanting to use Yifa's finger to sign a contract, Seika suddenly appears, riding his new dragon friend. With everyone too stunned to move, Seika says he needs help, warming up the dragon's egg, asking for Yifa to join him. Gleefully running to Seika's side, Lisa attempts to stop her, but Yifa utters that she loves Seika. Soaring through the sky, Yifa thanks Seika for what he did, but Seika doesn't know what she's talking about. Arriving back at the egg, Seika shows Yifa the egg, but before they are able to do anything, they are attacked by a tiger summon. Halting the creature's attacks, Seika calls for the summoner to come out, realizing that the mercenaries were always after the dragon's valuable egg. Having tricked the prince into hiring them, the mercenary has the but in that split second, a huge blast of water sends the lion flying, as Yifa is seen making use of her ring, stating that she'll stand up for herself. Annoyed, the summoner has the lion attack once again, demanding that his men also follow after it, but Seika channels his white, incinerating the lion's existence. Having promised to destroy the mercenary's summon, Zekt wonders who Seika is, but Seika responds that he is the stronger sorcerer, causing Zekt to try to attack. Sadly, the dragon is able to scare away the mercenaries, but Seika traps them, as Yifa burns Zekt's summoning book. Impressed with Yifa's thinking, Seika pats Yifa on the head as a reward. Reporting to Cecilio on the traitorous mercenaries, the prince is saddened, but decides to lock the men up for now. Next Seika states that the stories of a human giving birth to a dragon was true, as dragons used to protect the kingdom, and in return humans would help them hatch their eggs. Asking if the prince could announce this to the citizens, the prince refuses as this is not enough evidence, instead he wants Seika to slay the dragon for him. Refusing, the prince is forced to lock up Seika, which Seika notes he should probably play along as the politics may get messy if he reveals his true powers. But when the prince offers to have Yifa become a citizen of Asteria, Seika can't hold back anymore, stating that the prince doesn't want to do anything, only having others do it for him, only for him to take all the credit. Additionally, seeing him make advances on Yifa, Seika calls the prince a child, only to realize he may have overstepped. Seeing that things are a mess, Lisa intervenes, asking for what Yifa truly feels. Stating that she wants to be with Seika, Cecilio has no choice but to give up on Yifa. Turning to Seika, Lisa apologizes for the trouble, asking to teasing Yifa for liking Seika. Lisa gifts Yifa some light elementals, to help her heal people, adding that Yifa reminds her of a powerful elf, who fell in love with the demon king. Riding back to school, Yifa tells Seika about her elven heritage, impressing Seika as she wonders the type of person Yifa is interested in. Trying to list off Seika's features, Yifa is unable to reveal her true feelings for him. Elsewhere a swordsman, an ogre, a psychic, a summoner and a minotaur all interrogate a human, even slaying a powerful creature to get to him. The swordsman states that he'll see to it that he slays the hero, even if it costs him his own life. As the gang walk through the school, Seika suddenly asks if Amiu would like to meet his family, which Yifa misinterprets as a marriage proposal. But Seika clears it up, 
as it's his father that wants to meet this mysterious swordsman, capable of wielding four affinities. Accepting, Mabel is also asked to join, only for Seika to head elsewhere, chatting to Yuki and revealing that there is someone important that wants to see Amiu for themselves, and that it must be something political. Greeting his brother Luft, Luft wonders why Seika looks unwell, but Seika brushes it off as him being a little sick due to the carriages. Complimenting his mature older brother, Seika introduces both Amiu and Mabel, only for Luft to return the favor. As a man, Edis, welcomes Seika and Yifa home, it's revealed that Edis is Yifa's father. Seeing Yifa grow more mature, Luft can't help but compliment her, but suddenly Gly calls out to Seika. Happy to see his brother, Seika compliments Gly's sleek armor, which Gly mentions that he must thank Seika, as he didn't expect to enjoy training to be a soldier, and that he would rather fight all day, than study. Still holding a grudge, after his humiliating defeat, Gly challenges Seika to a rematch, only for Amiu to learn that Gly used to bully Yifa. Stepping in, Amiu asks to fight in place of Seika, but Gly is clearly against, until Seika promises to duel him, if he wins. Agreeing, Gly has Seika referee the match, stating that no magic is allowed. Allowing Amiu to use a real sword, Gly states that all he needs is a wooden sword, which triggers Amiu. In the duel beginning, Amiu goes on the offensive, pushing Gly back. But when Gly is about to lose, he pretends to cast a spell, only to disarm Amiu and win. Calling Gly out for cheating, Gly mentions that he didn't actually cast a spell, and that in the battlefield, using tricks is more important than losing one's life. Turning to Seika, Gly talks about how he knows Seika won the mixed combat tournament, which gets Seika to accept the duel. Suddenly, a mysterious princess trots onto the field, prompting Gly to question why she's here, and with no one watching her. Having slipped past her guards, the princess hints at the fact that a knight's honor would be tainted, no matter what defeat they suffer, which Gly is forced to agree with, calling off the duel. Wanting to learn about Seika's gang, it's revealed that the girl is Princess Fiona Erd Allegelife, a holy princess. Apparently, Fiona was deemed the holy princess, as she was birthed by a priestess whilst having the emperor as her father. Asking about the princess's reason for visiting, they learn that Fiona is here to meet Amiu, learning about her high ranking in the school, not only academically, but magically and physically. Noting Amiu's gorgeous red hair, and green eyes, Fiona off-handedly mentions her deceased mother, but quickly changes the subject. Hoping to get along with the gang, the princess leaves, as Amiu questions whether Seika knew the princess would be here, but didn't tell anyone. During dinner, Fiona talks about wanting to fly, and she would like to be some sort of animal with the capability. When Seika offers a bird, Fiona says she would prefer something more powerful, like a dragon. Having met one himself, Seika recounts his and Yifa's adventure to Asteria, which gets the princess interested in Yifa's and Seika's relationship. Switching topics, Fiona talks about the genius of Seika's school, willing to enroll any child, no matter their status, and voluting magic highly. At the end of the table, Seika's father stares at Seika, flashing back to when his father asks Edis whether he's mad that they sent Yifa off to school. But Edis says that he's mad that Yifa is a slave to Seika, as Edis senses something strange from Seika. Thanking Seika for taking care of the dragons, his father says that news has spread of Seika's accomplishments, proud that his son is finding his own path in life. Before dinner ends, Seika is surprised, when his mother suddenly talks to Seika. Alone with his room, Yuki talks about how the princess was saying weird things, which Seika agrees, but states that in his past life, his wife was similar. Before Yuki can learn about his past wife, Amiu barges in, forgetting to knock. Laying on Seika's bed, the two begin to chat, as they talk about plans for the future. Learning that Amiu will probably set her sights on becoming an adventurer, Seika reveals that he will be joining her, as that was what he had promised. Asking if Amiu would show him the ropes, Amiu gleefully agrees, bidding him good night. Before heading off, Yuki reminds Seika to not stand out too much. The next morning while Mabel is still asleep, the princess, Gly, Seika and Amiu head into town, where Seika is showing the princess around. Knowing that the princess didn't want any guards around her, Seika realizes that he and Gly will have to protect the princess if anything were to arise. Entering a more crowded area, the princess suddenly grabs Seika's hand, pretending to be on a date. 
But Seika worries that this may tarnish her reputation, which she brushes off, asking Bly to buy them some food. Noticing people watching them, the princess spots a couple, wondering how two people fall in love. Saying that entails, usually after someone is saved, the two would fall in love, but the princess has always had to overcome her own challenges, wishing for the day someone comes and saves her. As they move on to a construction site, Amyu calls the two lovebirds out from holding hands, but they continue, as the princess rushes onto the site. With a pile of wood suddenly falling onto Seika and the princess, Bly quickly casts a wind spell to break the wood, as Amyu conjures an earth spell, to shield them from the debris. Wondering why Seika didn't protect himself, the princess shows disappointment, wanting to be saved by Seika. Before heading home, Seika gives the princess a hair tie, even conjuring a mirror to show off her new look. That evening, Seika praises Bly's hard work, constantly training, explaining how he became a holy knight. But Bly stops Seika, stating that he was not chosen because of his skills, but because the princess needs him for something else, being a master at manipulating politics. Apparently, Fiona's mother was an oracle, able to see into the future, and it seems the princess has similar traits, speaking of a hero and the demon king. Which Bly used to deduce that Amyu was the hero. Warning Seika to not grow too close, Bly heads off. Hearing the princess wanting to spend time with Seika, Seika frowns as he wants to learn more about Fiona's fortune telling. But Yuki wonders why, as Seika himself can see the future, but Seika reveals that fortune tellers can only see some information about the future, whereas Seika can see all of it. Nonetheless, Seika still intends to not get too involved. Running into Amyu, Seika learns that Gly has been helping her with her sword skill, but is surprised to learn that Amyu has yet to win a single duel against Gly. Knowing that Seika is hiding from the princess, Amyu says that Seika should at least spend some time with her, as tomorrow is the day they depart. Seeing the princess playing chess alone, Seika learns that the princess is currently undefeated. Asking to play Seika, the princess learns that Seika is a beginner, so she will remove some of her pieces from the start, to make it more fair. Additionally, Fiona asks to bet something, where the loser must do any one thing the winner decides, but the loser can reject the request if it seems too far-fetched. Since the bet is reasonable, Seika plays Fiona. Chatting. Fiona asks if Seika knows what is the strongest chess piece in the world, only for Seika to ponder, responding that it must be the people controlling the others, like politicians sitting in safety, as soldiers go off to war. Surprised with Seika's answer, the princess reveals that she personally believes that the strongest people are those who are unknown. This is because if someone is unable to anticipate everything, they are bound to lose to something. Since those around Fiona all have status, and armies by their side, the princess states that she's been trying to grow her name, suddenly declaring that she would win the match. Not surprised, Seika says that he realized that the princess had stopped Gly and Seika's match the other day, because she knew Seika would win, and that Gly and Kinda revealed her secret. But the princess seemed ecstatic, as she was going to tell Seika eventually, but didn't know how to. Continuing their game, Seika is clearly losing, but sticks it out till the end, commending the princess. Wondering why Seika doesn't think it's unfair for her to be using her foresight, Seika states that it still counts as her own strength, but it would be nice to learn about one of her fears, and what she is thinking. In her past, Fiona had always feared Stu as when she was younger she believed that eating too much bread would one day mean she would have a loaf of bread growing in her belly. Hearing the adorable and innocent thinking, Seika teases the princess, only for her to talk about one of her foresights. Using a child as an example, she states that she knows of someone doomed to fail, but she wants to save them. Leaving it at that, she allows Seika to interpret her thoughts how he will, fearing that the future may change. Before parting, Seika promises to help her any way he can, only for the princess to say she'll think of something for Seika to do, as per their bet. Elsewhere in a forest, we see the five mysterious monsters, Zor the Swordsman, Mudrav the Strongest Ogre, Loni a Powerful Tamer, Pyrshlari a Evil Eye User and Gulgani a Candidate to become the head of his clan. Wanting everyone around him to grow stronger, Zor tells everyone to eat up, uttering that he has the ability to see others' potential. With departure day arriving, Luft wishes Seika the best, saying that he should think about future careers, but Seika chooses to hide that he wants to become an adventurer. Next, thanking Yifa for his hard work, Luft wishes Yifa the best, 
whilst also offering Amyu and Mabel to come by any time. Wondering where Mabel has been, Seika learns that Mabel had been sleeping all day, wanting to marry a noble, and slacking around all day. With Gly rushing the gang, Gly neglects Luft, as they'll probably see each other in the future, prompting Fiona to tease Gly about his possible death. Bidding Luft farewell, everyone heads off. With Seika, Gly and Fiona as one carriage, Gly notes how quiet Seika gets, as he's clearly not used to the movement of the carriage. Wondering how Gly can both watch over the princess, and be head of his soldiers, Seika wonders what types of bandits people normally encounter, only to hear one of their empty carriages, placed as bait, being blown up. Hopping on top of his carriage, Seika spots the bandit's leader, upon a hill, commanding his men to spread out and target different carriages, all whilst their archers take, channeling a magnetic cloud. Seika is able to stop the enemy's arrow, prompting a sorcerer to cast a spell, with no effect on Seika's barrier. Realizing that most of the carriages are decoys, the leader chooses to focus on Seika, but Gly makes a courageous entrance, rallying his men, and having them easily attack the enemy. Hearing the princess wants to keep the men alive, Seika swiftly restrains all of them, ending the battle. Realizing that there was something suspicious, the three girls had turned around, but by the time they arrived, Seika had already restrained them all. But one thing is suspicious, as the enemy had chosen to attack, when they knew there would be knights protecting the carriages. Chatting to the princess privately, Seika learns that the men are assassins, and that one of her rivals must have sent them after her. Wondering if they were all coming back to the capital, the princess says yes, as that is the reason for all the decoy carriages, having anticipated everything. Worried that one of them might break free and try to attack, the princess reveals that the captured are planning to meet up with reinforcements, so they'll wait for the right time but the princess knows that reinforcements will never come, as they were slain by Zor and his four monsters. Arriving at the entrance of the town, the gang chat with the princess, as Fiona thanks everyone for being so welcoming to her. As it's time to leave, Fiona hints at meeting Amyu again, only to tell Seika to not forget that she is always on his side. In the dead of night, we see Zor and his members rushing through the forest, as Zor states that their mission is to kill the hero, only to return home safe. Hearing each of them have their own ambitions, they arrive near the school. Having returned to the school, Seika speaks with the principal, who asks for Seika with an upcoming ceremony. Knowing that it may help him for future jobs, Seika accepts, but as Seika chats with Yuki, Seika states that is tired of always being afraid of standing out, and now he would act normally, and if something happens, he'll handle it without anyone seeing. Following Zor, we see him assess the school, knowing that there shouldn't be any adventurers or real threats that'll be able to get in their way. Turning to his team, he rehashes the plan, asking for the four of them to attack the school from all four corners, driving the students towards the center, where they'll be able to wipe them all out. Additionally, if any of them were to spot the hero, they would signal everyone else. Ending off the speech, Zor states that after the mission, they'll all be renowned among the demon race. Seeing the low knee pumped for their mission, the Mudrav chimes in telling them of one of his courageous adventures. But before he can ramble on, Zor has Gull begin an incantation, splitting them up, across the school. Following Gull, he notices a thick red smog, obscuring his vision. Noticing some students, Gull apologizes, as he lets loose a powerful spell, but notes something is off. Following the low knee, and the Pyrschlaria, they make use of the low knee's navigation ability, easily moving through the smog. Chatting about the past, Pyrschlaria compliments Low Knee, having been the weakest in their party, but recently the Low Knee has grown stronger, being able to make use of their monsters. Replying, Low Knee learns that Pyrschlaria has been more energetic recently, knowing that if they slay the hero, she'll be able to tell her parents about her accomplishments. But suddenly, Low spots a student, sending wolves after the child, but when Low calls for the wolves to come back, Low receives something strange. Next Mudrev is seen slowly making his way around the school, not wanting to stand out, and give away his presence. Suddenly, Mudrev blocks several daggers, calling out the attacker to come out. Impressed by Mabel's strength, compared to her little figure, Murderev challenges her, whilst Mabel notes that she has never seen an ogre before. Swiping at Mudarev's feet, Mabel watches as Mudrev leaps into the air, bringing his seeing Mabel only defending, Mudrev is caught off guard when Mabel changes the gravity of her axe, 
forcing him to back off. When the two clash weapons, Mudrev is able to disarm Mabel, but he fell for her trap, as she encases Mudrev in dark magic. But Mudrev breaks free, having learned from Zor, that he's immune to all types of magic. As Mabel attempts to back off, Mudrev smashes Mabel, only to realize that she is gone, and instead there is a talisman alone. Cutting to Gull, and Zor, we see the two realize that they've both wound up in the same location, but it's not where they were aiming for. A few seconds later, Mudrev, Lo and Pyrshlaria all mysteriously join them, all noting how strange the humans they encountered were. Hearing that they all encountered talismans, they all turn to hear Seika recounting a poem, as he levitates above them all. As Zor prepares to attack, he first scans Seika's potential, only to freeze in place. With Mudrev attempting to challenge Seika, his head is suddenly cut off, as Seika is seen fiddling with one of his talismans, meant to represent Mudarev's body. Noting how weak Mudrev was, Seika taunts the others, stating how weak Mudrev was, against Seika's curses. Enraged Pyrshlaria flies into the air, attempting to enchant Seika with her evil eye, but Seika welcomes the challenge, bringing out a white snake that glares at Pyrshlaria. Suddenly, Pyrshlaria starts to act up, suddenly collapsing to the ground, as Lo rushes to check on Pyrshlaria, all whilst Seika announces that her heart has stopped beating. Looking at the snake, the others are shocked to see, the white snake has no eyes, wondering how powerful the creature is. Before Seika can tell them about the white snake's history, Lo brings out his own summon, distracting the snake long enough to get close. Speaking to the creature, Lo reasons that they should become friends, but Zor realizes that it's pointless, as the white snake devours Lo. Seika reveals that the white snake can't easily be tamed, all whilst Zor thinks about how pointless it was from the start. When Gull asks for what Zor sees, Zor states that Seika has the same capabilities as the Demon King himself. Hearing that, Gull asks for Zor to run, but Zor states that it would be better for Gull to flee with his teleportation magic, and to not let the team die in vain. Having heard enough, Seika lets out a huge wave of lava, as Zor buys time for Gull. Having barely made it out alive, Gull is unable to accept the fact that Seika is a student. Back with Seika, we see him sad that he didn't wipe them all out, but doesn't care, as he doesn't see them as threats. Hearing Yuki quiver in fear, Seika reassures her that he wasn't taking the battle seriously, only to see Mabel running to him. Demanding Seika to show her where Mudrev is, Seika realizes that Mabel has been worried about assassins hunting her down, but still prioritizes the lives of others over hers. Comforting her, Seika reveals that he had dealt with the ogre, and to not tell anyone about it. Back at the dining hall, we see the gang chatting with Seika, as if nothing had happened. Apparently Seika is tasked with giving a speech to the school, just like what Amiu had to do, in their opening ceremony. Asking for advice, Amiu says that she wasn't nervous, and that she said what she personally believes, but if she were to do it again, she would probably be nervous. Before Seika is able to present, several knights, under Marquis Greville Barge Inn, demanding for Amiu. When Amiu speaks up, the knights reveal that she is under arrest, having slain a demon visitor yesterday, which Seika finds suspicious. As the head knight demands to know if Amiu will confess to murdering a high-ranking demon visitor. Amiu denies what she is being accused of, forcing the men to arrest her. Before Mabel can attack the knights, Seika stops her, stating that he knows she is innocent. Hearing this several knights ready their blades to attack Seika, but the head knights warn his men to not touch any of the students, retreating with Amiu. Questioning the principal, she confirms that there was a demon visitor previously, and that the demon did go missing, but the principal wonders who must have done the crime. Knowing Seika wants answers, the principal reveals that she is using her authority, along with other connections, to put pressure on the accusers, but it might take a while. Knowing that things may end badly for Mabel the longer they wait, Seika puts on a devious grin, pointing out the flaws in the principal's passive thinking, only to apologize for being so forward with her. As Yifa and Mabel wait for Seika, they rush to his side, learning that the principal said she would deal with it. But still they wonder if this is the best thing to do, but Seika says it is. That night, Seika heads into a forest, calling forth Ryu, his most powerful dragon summon. Calling for Ryu to listen to his orders, Seika has trouble, but eventually gets the dragon to obey. Suddenly Yuki pops out, 
asking for Seika to reconsider, as he is about to take on the most powerful people in the kingdom, and that this for sure will reveal his true strength to the world. With a pissed off face, Seika calmly explains that he'll just have to slay everyone that knows his secret, which Yuki has no response to. Hopping on Ryu, Seika demands Ryu fly west, instantly disappearing into the night sky. Following Amiu, we see her begin to despair, fearing that she'll never get to see her friends again. With Seika already making it to the capital, he scatters his talismans all throughout the city, having them convert to rats, who all search for Amiu. Having located her, Seika casually struts into the fortress holding Amiu. Seeing an on-duty knight, the knight suddenly signals for all of his men to begin attacking Seika. Seeing hundreds of arrows approaching, Seika conjures a magnetic cloud, deflecting every single Before the men can begin attacking, Seika creates massive boulders, having them crush all the knights facing him. Breaking through the first line of defense, Seika warns the next wave of knights to stand down, but the men ignore his warning. Casting his white flame, Seika is able to delete a portion of the knights, only to summon his sickle weasel, who begins carving up the remaining knights. As some of the men choose to attack Seika, Seika simply begins igniting the men, with his blue flame. Having made it to Amu's cell, Seika greets her, saying that she is now free to go. But knowing Seika, Amu questions how Seika got here, only to reassure him that she'll be okay, and it's not worth sacrificing his own name, to save hers. Knowing this is the best opportunity, Seika reveals to Amiu that she is the hero. Telling her about the reincarnation of both the Demon King and the hero, Seika states that it's common for the weak to yearn for the strong to fall, and that in any world, the strongest are doomed to fall, which includes Amiu. Before Seika is able to take Amiu away, he suddenly senses someone approaching, casting a spell, only for it to be blocked. Greeting his brother Gly, Seika asks if Gly would like to duel, or else he should stand down. Suddenly, Fiona appears, asking Seika to listen to her words, reassuring him that her men are standing guard on the surface. Knowing Fiona had foreseen Amiu being locked up, Seika asks why Fiona would let Amiu even be put in such a risky situation. Recounting the past feats of the previous heroes, Fiona states that in the past, the hero was the one turning ship that allowed victory over the demons. But now that the demons have a demon king, and civilization has evolved, both humans and demons know that a single hero or demon king can no longer flip the tables in a war. Instead they are most dangerous as they both can start a war. Fearing that another war would start because of the hero, the demons have sent spies and assassins to eliminate Amiu. Additionally, Fiona states that Amiu will never be as strong as the past hero, because Seika is here, always dealing with the danger beforehand and never allowing her to be put in any sort of risky situation. Refusing to believe that Amiu is simply a disposable pawn, Fiona reassures Seika that she will personally do everything she can to keep Amiu alive, and if Seika leaves now he will not be charged. Realizing that Fiona is using the favor she won, from playing chess, Seika refuses the favor, wondering why he should listen to her after all that has happened. Ordering Gly to lead his men elsewhere, Fiona asks Seika to take Amiu and follow her leading them to a carriage, stocked with all essentials, needed to make their way to a neighboring kingdom, Fiona wishes Amiu the best, hoping to meet again. Apologizing to the princess, for not holding up their deal, Seika instead gives her a gift. Unleashing hundreds of his talismans, Seika begins chanting a resurrection spell, reviving all the men he slaughtered, along with repairing the walls of the fortress he smashed. Amazed at Seika's power, Fiona wishes him the best, as Seika and Amiu head towards the carriage. Chatting with Amiu, she's still unable to digest what Seika and the princess meant, when they said Amiu is doomed to die, and that Amiu would neve get stronger. But before Amiu presses on, she reasons it would be best for them to head to the capital first. Back with Fiona, we see her talking to a figure hiding in her shadow, asking about the demonic power of Seika. But Fian responds that Seika is this generation's demon king, making him a protector of the hero, never heard before. As he's such a kind person, Fiona knows that Seika will have lots of hardship in his near future, nonetheless she has high hopes. Making their way to the city of Rachna, Seika realizes that he'll have to apologize to Yifa and Mabel for leaving them behind, and that they had only one year left till graduation. But Amiu cheers him up, as they will get to become adventurers, sooner than expected. 
As Fiona writes a letter to Mabel and Yifa, we see Seika and Amiu slowly make their way to the city of Rachna. The series ends, with the whole gang reuniting, all ecstatic to see each other alive and well. Thanks for watching. Subscribe.